Oh, I mean, no, I have no problem. You're, you're, I, I, you're, I, always, you're gonna do that anyway. I mean, I moderated the, the last one. Which one is this one? Oh, this is rebooting Doctor Who and how we would do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, this is the how would we reboot Doctor Who ourselves? Um, and like I always like to do, since I am now the de facto moderator, um, we'll start at the very end down there and we'll introduce ourselves. Barb Fisher, and I am the writer for the webcomic Sludge Bunny, and currently the writer for the webcomic Fragile Gravity. Okay. I'm John Bethencourt. I'm a writer, uh, science fiction books mostly. Um, I've worked on uh, Star Trek, Superman, lots of uh, media-related stuff for uh, the professional publishers in New York. My name's Tom Rockwell. I go, go under the name Devo Spice. I'm a comedy rapper. I feel myself as the redheaded stepson of Weird Al Yankovic and Eminem. That's the easiest way to describe what I do. Uh, I've been watching Doctor Who since I was eight or nine or something like that. And I'm performing at four o'clock over in Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Um, Alan Moen. I am an artist, contemporary art, and performance art as well. Uh, as far as my contemporary art is concerned, I've shown in Maryland, Philly, uh, Delaware and Vancouver, which is my biggest show. Um, Sorry, I'm late. Pretty much it. And this is our moderator. Oh, this is our actual moderator. Yeah. Oh, we're oh, supposed, supposed, supposed to be moderating, moderating this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're just saying that because I'm late. No, no. no. <laughs> there it really is an M by your name. Yeah. Really? Yeah. God damn it. So we, we made Davey do it. So yes. We're here. Oh, okay. Well, you yeah. can keep going. I'm okay. fine with that. Cool. Well, then you sit here and introduce yourself while I get introduce yourself while I get it. I signed up to be on a panel with you, Keith. That, that you have to moderate. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> here, I'll just here. I'll sit on the side here. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm sure I'm not on the camera there, but that's okay. Oh, it's okay. That's okay. I don't want to break the thing. Hi, I'm Keith. Um, I have the uh, oddly irrelevant distinction of being the first native-born North American citizen to write official Doctor Who fiction. Hoo-ha! Um, I, I had a story in a 1996 anthology published by Virgin, which had the license at the time, called, uh, the anthology was called Decalogue 3. There was also a story in there by some obscure British guy named Stephen Moffat. It was, uh, I don't know if you know who that is. I, I, I always wondered what happened to him. He had a, he had a good story, though. Um, no, I remember, actually, in all seriousness, the, uh, uh, Moffat's story in Decalogue there was brilliant. I thought it was one of the ten best Doctor Who stories I'd ever read, which is why, when when um, I read he would be writing stuff for the uh, for the reboot of the show in uh, in 2005, I was very happy because I had seen that story way back in 1996. Um, I've been a fan of Doctor Who since I was eight years old and found it on my black and white TV in my bedroom, uh, and. Uh, and I've also done, I've written, besides that uh, one story, I also wrote a story for one of uh, the charity anthologies that Outpost Gallifrey did in 2001 called Missing Pieces. Um, a short story for one of the short trips anthologies, uh, Destination Prague, where I did a Golem of Prague story. And um, I also edited The Quality of Leadership, another one of the big Finnish short trips anthologies, where I was responsible for both Peter David and Diane Dwayne writing Doctor Who fiction for the first time. Um, the odd thing being that it took that long for it to happen. But uh, anyway, so that's me. So what were we talking about? No, I actually I didn't. Go for it. You want me to? Okay. Um, who are you? Yes, who am I? Um, I am uh, Debbie Beauchamp. Um, I'm a writer, a librarian. I do a lot of different things. Produce movies now, which is really strange. And I also have a... Right. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I'm now doing a, which got me through grad school, a video podcast about Dr. Who. Thanks. From the American standpoint. Uh, what we think of it, what we like about it, um, and it's strangely growing in popularity. I don't know why or how. It's about but Doctor Who. I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but yeah, that's who I am. And I'm pretty sure most people in this room actually know who I am anyway, so. I didn't. You're who? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's 
Yeah. So, do you want me to actually moderate this panel now? Yes. Okay. What are we supposed to be talking about? Rebooting Doctor Who. <laughs> Rebooting Doctor Who. Okay. How would you do it? Um, is that what we're supposed to talk about? Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay, I thought we were going to be talking about... I, I, the impression I got was... Show you how much I paid attention. Um, I thought we were going to be talking about the actual rebooting of Doctor Who that, that happened seven years ago, but I guess not. That's, um, that's old. Now. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, what uh, also and to be fair, it wasn't really a reboot either. No, you know, right. I mean, no, uh, yeah. uh, and it's. And, and, I mean, I don't know if you really can reboot Doctor Who. I mean, what would you have to do to it in order to reboot it? It yeah. reboots itself all the freaking time. Well, you know, yeah. the, the, uh, I mean, it, 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 you could argue that it rebooted itself in 1966 when, when William Hartnell couldn't continue. Um, and, and in essence, they, you know, they, they started over with, with Patrick Troughton. I mean, it's, uh, it, the show has always been kind of multifaceted and flexible and, and um, unwilling to be tied down by such irrelevant concerns as consistency. Um, <laughs> But you can get away with that with time travel anyway. Rebooting know. is inherent to the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah in, fact, in fact, the story I mentioned that, that Moffat wrote for, for Decalogue 3 uh, was called Continuity Errors and has the Doctor constantly going back and changing things in, in somebody's past in order to, to make his life easier, basically, or to, and to save the day. So, uh, something similar to what he did in the uh, Christmas Carol, Christmas special. Um, but none of the, the reboots have been that radical when you think about it. There's always been a... A certain sameness to it, right? In that it's well, always ultimately, I mean, I mean, ultimately, male, in order, it's always British. The, the first yeah. Doctor's, well, at least the first part of his run was very different from the first part True. Of the show because he was still Earth. Earth. Yeah, well, you know, he couldn't travel through time and couldn't use a TARDIS. I, I want a woman Doctor. <laughs> I, I'm kind of good with that time. Yeah. <laughs> or, or perhaps even. Um, Hispanic doctor, a black doctor, or I'd like to go back and. He wants to be ginger. I want to play. I actually, want to go back. <laughs> I would like to go back to the original Time Lord, and this is not in '66 or '63, but 1959. He was about this big. He had a ginger companion. He had a time machine. He went back and fixed things. He did horrible puns. He was a dog. I want them to acknowledge Mr. Peabody <laughs> <laughs> because he is. <laughs> I, think, I think he just Nick Gallifrey technology. And no, because he was first. Yeah. 1959, man. Yeah. <laughs> the doctor's course. Yeah, sure. Sure. Charlotte has an excuse for being so dim because he's only six years old while all, all the Doctor Who companions don't have that excuse. No. The, um, I lost my train of um, oh, the uh, actually you mentioned there being you know possibly a, a, a black doctor is that actually uh, supposedly one of the people being considered when Christopher Eccles after Christopher Eccleston's first season was Patterson Joseph who was in the last uh, the, he was in the, the final two Eccleston's final two parter um, he was he was allegedly somebody considered and one of the people that has been thrown out as a possibility also is Lenny Henry who would be a great doctor. Wait, um, I think Henry was said uh, once the Doctor in some parody. Oh yeah, yeah, he did a comic relief parody at one point, as as did Rowan Atkinson, and, and for which was also written by Stephen Moffat. Notice how these things. Keep, there's only about six actual British writers, so um, <laughs> uh, they use pseudonyms occasionally. But um, uh, it, yeah, but it's all actually done by Stephen Moffat, Paul Cornell, and and uh, Russell T Davies, and, and three other guys, and that's it. There, there really aren't any others. Um, but. Uh, the, th the thing about, if, if I mean, um, if, if you mentioned, you know, the, the not, why is it always British and male? And, and I suppose there are other, you could redo them uh, as a non-Brit, but it would look, it would sound fun. Well, not also, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, um, to, because rebooting is such a huge part of the series itself, in order to reboot it, you have to take it back to, like, a whole new universe. You'd have to recast the aliens. You'd have to do drastic changes to make it anything new. <laughs> Um, Give the make new Daleks with the ability to use stairs. Yes. <laughs> Don't they hover? Yeah. 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 They it took them yeah. years to figure out how to do that. Yeah. Well, no, it took it took years for the special effects budget to be able to do that. <laughs> 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 let's let, let's let's call a spade a spade here. You know, uh, it took it took them until the '80s to be able to actually pull that off. Yeah. Right. people to do that. Yeah. There's so much the creative you could do, and you could do a combo of Glee and Doctor Who. Where of which, I'm sorry? Glee. Ah. Yeah. Where wow. It's all teen angst, and right. the Doctor could be the teacher, and you time travel, sing songs in the past. You there you know, go. There's yeah. enormous yeah. possibilities. Sing songs from the era in which you go to. Filmation did that in 1971. It was called Mission Magic. Oh, yeah. God. 
Okay. Sure. Well, imagine if you go just for Elvis Presley and sing Elvis Presley songs, you're going to get a lot of money because Elvis is not there to compete with you. Right. So. Although, you know, somebody does control the rights to that. But, um... Mm -hmm. Not before he was born. <laughs> it's kind of a Doctor Who sentai. Don't, don't let him figure out how they can do that so they can go back fast. Oh, you actually stole our song. <laughs> we had yeah. eminent copyrights in both directions in time. It's like Back to the Future when Michael J. Fox created Johnny Be Good. Johnny Be Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, the original concept of Doctor Who, when they were first putting it together, it went through a bunch of different changes, and, and there, were, there were some early drafts of the concept where the Doctor wasn't the main character. It was about Ian and Barbara, and uh -huh. to a lesser extent, and Su Susan and, and the Doctor were just sort of the catalyst for allowing these two characters to, to travel through time. And it might, one possible, you know, way to redo it is to do it more from that, that original perspective, is to do it about two ordinary people who get sucked into a time machine, uh, or almost kidnapped into a time machine, and then... And then Sounds like the time tunnel. Then you have time tunnel. Yeah. 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 With this, with this elder state, with this crotchety old fart who who keeps giving you weird responses to things and all. But you can't have it. Why not? I don't know. I, th I don't think it would work. Well, they do it in other genres. In comic books, uh, there are, there have been a number of books that were based on the the, the Batman uh, uh, characters that were about like you know, all of them probably have the name Gotham in them that focus on you know secondary characters and their experiences in Gotham hmm. as they're affected by the main characters Batman, Robin, especially the villains and stuff. So it can be done, <laughs> um, and sometimes it spawns something different. Like you look at Swamp Thing, you look at John Constantine as a spinoff. Um, We've well, already had that with Torchwood and Sarah Jane, really. Exactly. And to a lesser extent, Kano. But so they they did it. It's just not yeah. in the main story. Thought it was, I thought they had a really good thing going there for a while, where you had you had Doctor Who for sort of the the that the kid the, the kids could watch, and then you had for the really little kids you had Sarah Jane, and then for the grown ups you had Torchwood. Um, yeah. Everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> And depending entirely, cause, well, I mean, the BBC still views Doctor Who ultimately as a kids' show, even yeah. though they've they've pushed that envelope very far. But when I was doing the short trips anthologies, the 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 one of the constant notes I was getting from the BBC on on the approvals process was, this is still a kids' show. You know, we had one of the stories we did. The quality of leadership had him going through time, uh, visiting different leaders throughout history, and one of the stories involved Queen Boudicca, and we had to tone down the rapey aspects of her of her uh, of her story because you know this is for kids. I think that's an awesome thing, though, that they keep it anchored that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. You don't find it a little too scary at parts? I mean, because that first episode with the Weeping Angels scared the crap out of me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, like I said, they do push that, but the, the idea is to frighten the kids in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, part of the concept is you're supposed to have to run behind the sofa. And yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's it. And, and, and it's all an and it's all intellectual horror. It's right. not, yeah. you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Horror, I mean, there was no blood, blood or anything. Yeah. Right. Which is why it works. Tested all his old kids. Yeah. 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 He must be some messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're Moffat's kids. They're pretty much pre messed yeah, up. Yeah, they're pre messed up probably. Same. I remember the name of the aliens that are that were in last season or the season before where only the main character could see them in the Silence. bathroom. Silence. 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 Thank Silence. you. Yeah. Um, I'm bad with names, I'm sorry. Um, That's okay, Fred. I thought that was, that was a good, <laughs> good angle. Right, Tim. <laughs> so what other, what other ways could we reboot Doctor Who? Audience suggestions. Yeah. Well, one thing, well, one thing you could do is not. I mean, one, 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 I mean, it's become an iconic part of, of Doctor Who. But the police box was something that made sense in 1963 in England. <laughs> in England. Yeah. yeah. Travels in a cell phone. Well, no. Yeah, even a phone booth wouldn't work anymore. Yeah, no, 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 phone booth would work okay. Work just fine. Clown car. A Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> a Mini Cooper. There you go. Don't say Mini Cooper. I drove here from Delaware. It was five hours. I was in front of a Mini Cooper, next to a Mini Cooper, and behind a Mini Cooper. I currently hate Mini Coopers. <laughs> and they all went but, 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 as they went down the street. Yes, they did. My best friend one. Guys one. <laughs> what about like if he year? was on the road when I there was you going, go. I don't like your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was there was, no, um, there was a, a Doctor Who riff actually that uh, Joe Duffy did in an old Power Man and Iron Fist comic from like 1984. I have. Uh, yeah, the, with, oh. with 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 uh, the incinerate, incinerate. Yes. Oh, it was it was the a total. The, the, but the dreadlocks. What I, but what I, the dreadlocks? Yes, uh, with an X. Um, what I liked though was that version of the TARDIS, which was a, an old used bookstore 
that would just appear between two other stores. And then when he went off to his next adventure, suddenly the bookstore was gone and the two buildings were back together. Again. It got, that, that comic got reprinted in an action figure packet. Of, Did it? Of, cool. of, of the old... Of, the, the original Fist, yeah. Power Man and Iron Fist from the 70s when they were cool. Yes. It's the silk shirt and the headband. And the headband and, and, the, and, and the chain and Sweet, yeah, Christmas. Sweet Christmas, right. Yes. Uh, Sweet Christmas. Sweet Christmas make us kind of feel like Hollywood um, producers. All right, so we love this concept. We've just got a couple of... Let's completely destroy <laughs> it. Yeah. Does it have to be a box? Right. And does it have to be blue? Right. <laughs> Why can't one of the twins be black? <laughs> Seriously, that was an actual Hollywood note that, that a friend of mine got when he was in a meeting with the producer. Why can't one of the twins be black? <laughs> but, uh... Why does it have to be bigger on the inside? <laughs> well, because they won't. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. 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 Sarah, can you reach down and hand me that card? Oh, that's not the card. No, not that one! <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch that! That's not my fine screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that actually happened in an old uh, episode of Galaxy High School. They did, mm. they did the everybody crams into the phone booth thing. Yeah. And then you hear one of the characters say, that's not the receiver. <laughs> but then they added a line. Look out, that's my foot. <laughs> but you can, you can tell that somebody at BSP insisted that they add the second line. Yeah. yeah. Just so there wasn't any. Yeah. Just so the joke didn't work anymore. Anyway. Well, exactly. Yes. Well, they did the opposite thing in, in Blazing Saddles. This, this scene, it's all in the dark. And, um, you know, is it true what they say about, you know, yeah, about right. the ship? And then the, the line they cut out was, man, I'm, you're sucking on my arm or my elbow yeah. or something like that. Wow. It was still funny, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> But, All right. So other 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 suggestions from well, you know you could keep the TARDIS working correctly so it changes every time it lands somewhere. So An actual functioning uh, chameleon circuit? Yeah, exactly. So they did for like one Colin Baker story, yeah. and that was it. And then you can have stories where it keeps forgetting what it's changed. Everybody it's remember where we parked. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a TARDIS, but now it's a bookstore, and now it's a. Um, well, they, they did that for budgetary. Problem. Constraints, didn't they? Kept it the same because otherwise they'd have to make a new prop every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and this also because it was a kids' show, they were afraid that the kids were going to get confused that they got into something different. Every yeah, day. I would have gotten confused. And there was an element of that, you know. Yeah. Although that Colin Baker one was fun when they, they had to, you know, they walked behind the organ that was in the middle of the. Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> funny. Like they did that with the master. Like the master would turn his TARDIS into a column. It's like, where's the door? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just looked like walk behind it and suddenly magically he's inside the TARDIS, you know. A friend of mine wrote a story in school, uh, in college, and he did the TARDIS, and, and it would change, and he changed it to a tree in Nottingham back in the day, and all of a sudden there's this guy in green with an arrow and a bow staying there. This isn't my tree. And it was very cool. It was, it was British, good blend, and he nailed it. He got an A, so hey, can't argue. Where do you hide a tree? <laughs> Anywhere in the forest. Yeah, just, uh, he did. In the middle of the forest, made a tree, and they got each other's trees wrong. Oh, no. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> oh, maybe we can fix the aliens. Maybe they're insufficiently uh, humanoid. Sometimes. We can just add a little line on the forehead or the nose whenever we need to differentiate them. Right. Because yeah. Star Trek. that works so well. Aliens, aliens are all human with seafood glued to their faces. Yeah, basically. Yes. Yes. With product replacement, yeah, have the aliens with, with like uh, Nestle logos or something. Uh, one of the things they're aliens, I, not soccer players. One of the things I'd love to see the, the current show do with the aliens is give them more character, give them more backstory and stuff. Because Doctor Who do, doesn't suffer to, from this to the extent that Star Wars does, where there's an ice planet and then there's a fire planet. But even in, in Doctor Who, we have, you know, this is the planet of the Daleks. That's where they come from. You know, this is the planet of the Cybermen. That's where they come from. And we don't know anything about them. And it wouldn't be. Well, what they did about the Daleks. Planet. They did. They did. They well, yeah, they had, they had like eventually they filled. Yeah, them. yeah, and you know, but you have to go back to the original series to to pick up all yeah. that backstory. They didn't do too much in the in the new run. I agree with you to an extent. I, well, I the new one didn't like do it because they already did it in the original series. I mean, they, yeah, the, 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 the they're they're not they're trying not to trot over ground that's already been covered. Yeah, I know, but I, but know. even with the with the new yeah. monsters, I'd love to see yeah. mm. subcultures emerge within the races. Yeah. I kind of like. Well, the way you did have the the the. the I kind of like the way the lines just by second. You know there's more meat there, and when they touch on it, I think it's kind of cool, but without going too deep into it. Well, they don't have to go too deep into it. But, you know, it's like the angels. 
They're yeah. there, they're scary, they're gone. And you don't really know much about them. Well, that, 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 you, you run the risk that of making your monsters not be scary anymore. Which, you know, part, yeah. part, part of yeah, what... Yeah, there has to be a mystery. There has yeah, to be I mean, mystery. especially with something like, like the Weeping Angels and, and the Daleks, for that matter. The, what, what makes them effective is the fact that they're monsters, not that yeah. they're, well, I mean, I you think know, the alien angels, species as such. They, they have been filling that in little by little. I mean, when when they went to the, the what, Time of the Angels, the, the yeah. two-parter, yeah, we yeah. got a little bit more about their backstory. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't need the whole backstory. Um, I, I, I like the mystery. Yeah. Um, I mean, the dialects, I mean, it's great that we, you know, if you go back to the old stuff, I mean, you get their, their full story. Um, and that mystery, like, that's what separates a monster from just the villain, right? Yeah. And and you do get it with some of them. The Santarians have an entire, you know, military culture. Oh, yeah. Probably the best example of the Silurians. Yeah. You know, even going back, you know, to the Pertwee era and, again, and continuing into the into the modern version of them, which mu with much better makeup, um, the, the, there's, a, there's a level of... Tragedy to those characters because they're just fighting to, you know. They were the original. That team. I thought yeah. was fantastic. With the 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 one with their they were they're they're coming out of the ground. Yeah. They're re reawakening. That. Yeah. I thought that episode was fantastic because that was you know we got a story and they had clear motivation as to what they were going to do. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. And they weren't just being evil. They, they weren't were, just they being were, evil. They were protecting they were their characters. Home. And yeah. there was there was inter conflict between the Solorians. Between you yeah. know the doctor and the military, and they you know there was interculture clashes. Who wrote that one? I don't remember. Uh, we're we're talking almost fifty years of television. I can't remember who. No, no, no. I mean, the, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean the, the new the new episode with the Solari. Yeah, 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 I don't. I, I really don't remember. Anybody? Anybody? I was for, for that episode. Yeah, nerds are the lizard masks. Yeah. is actually how they look, but the human faces are how the doctor sees them. Yeah. Well, the human face. I mean, the thing is, the human face actually looks the the, the one the, the current version of the makeup is much more convincing. It doesn't look like somebody in a suit. <laughs> it doesn't look like somebody in a lizard suit. Yeah, um, and I do like the the one member of the Silurians who became a Victorian kick-ass vigilante, <laughs> which is a perfect yeah, example of what you were talking I just about. Just want to let you know, who's going to bring the Ood into this? <laughs> the Ood are an interesting. Character. Uh, yeah, they're not very practical. But they're not. No. I mean, they, they, they're one of those things. They, 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 they're, they're better for how they look and act. And if you actually look at them too closely, they don't entirely work. But they look cool. Yeah. I want to know how they eat. Yeah. They're kind of like the universal conscience, though. Yeah. When things are bad. It happens to the ood, and we feel bad that it's happened to the ood. Until they're killing people, then you're like, ah, I can't feel so bad that horrible things have happened to you because ah. <laughs> But also the whole, you know, holding the globe thing. How the hell did that evolve? That just busts. It's like the version of the cell phone. Right. That's all. So we'll be like that in the future, always holding our cell phones no matter what? In order it's to coming. Be, you know, walk around with your brain in your hand. And <laughs> it comes back. Yeah. It's actually a pipe. I'm just trying to look distinguished. Yeah. What about multiple Time Lords? I know he's supposed to be the last one, but if it's a reboot... I mean, there's somebody causing him trouble. That's also Time Lord. Well, I mean, that would be that would be in essence going back to what you know, they were doing in the original series, particularly in the, particularly for the uh, in the Pertwee era, where where the Time Lords were constantly sending him on errands and making his life miserable. Well, I mean, yeah. we don't know what actually happened after the Big Bang Two. A right. lot of stuff right. got rebooted that we don't know know fully about yet. I mean, yeah. we got old Cybermen back with that reboot. So, I mean, there's very easily could be uh, they could do anything you know, at this point. Yeah. Exactly. Well, well, yeah, like they couldn't before. And, and also, <laughs> and also <laughs> that's what I mean. That's really what I mean. I, that, that, that's why I said what I said at the beginning of the panel. What would you have to do to it in order to reboot it? You know, I mean, it's rebooting all the time. Davey, what would you like to see them bring back? I honestly, I would like to see, uh, see the Time Lords come back. I mean, to be, be perfectly honest, um, and what really surprises me, I'm, I'm listening to Shada right now, uh, the, the new one, and wow. Oh, the one with McGann? No, this is oh. uh, this, Lila Ward's reading it. They, they, oh, is this a reading of the yeah. script? Well, no, it, it's uh, another author. Uh, BBC gave him the original shooting script, ah. and he's flushed it out. I didn't realize there were so many renegade Time Lords before there were renegade Time Lords. <laughs> and, and prison planets and all this other jazz. I mean, I don't know how they would have filmed Shada back in the day, but it's a really interesting story by Adams. Well, it's okay if you you can always just read the first Dirk Gently book and most of it's in there anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. Which is a show I'm, I'm I'm digging right now that that they're that they're airing. Oh, they're doing a yeah, they're doing yeah. a whole. Oh, show. did that finally that finally yeah. started airing? Yeah, yeah. I knew it was in development. I didn't know it was it's third episode. So okay. much fun. 
I knew, I knew, I knew that was in development, but I didn't know. Yeah, that. but yeah, I'd like to see the master back. I mean, that's one of the things I, I liked him having that, 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 that opposite. That certainly were. Although I got to tell you, uh, Derek Jacoby in six seconds was a more effective master than any of the others, and that's with no insult intended toward Roger Delgado or John Sim or Anthony Angley. But holy crap, was he amazing in those yeah, six seconds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eric Roberts wasn't in that list. There's a that that was a deliberate choice. <laughs> um, that, that because I'm thing. perfectly willing to offend <laughs> Eric Roberts. Um, when, I, when I saw Derek Jacoby, I was. Why did you switch to John Sam Jacoby? Would have been so damn scary. Um, uh, probably because they couldn't really afford Derek Jacoby exactly. for one episode. Because <laughs> he's Derek fucking Jacoby. But he had so much fun. Oh yeah, yeah. And and you know, and, and watching him as the professor for that matter, you know. And yeah. He, uh, he was where he was basically, you know, he he does the befuddled act so well, as well, you know. Um, but uh, and and from what I understand, um. But our Cumberbatch is going to be coming on as the new regeneration of the Master, as well. Yeah, that's that's Which, what I'm hearing. Oh, that wrong. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I don't think it's going to happen until the fiftieth. I think yeah. I think that's yeah. waiting yeah. for that. But while while I enjoy John, but, but, it was funny because I John Sim is, is somebody who I I had only seen John Sim in Life on Mars, so when he showed up in the you know when he regenerated in the TARDIS and started cackling and running about, it's like wow, I had no idea John Sim could do that. <laughs> yeah. I thought he was channeling Frank Gorshin. A little bit, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, no, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you're playing a villainous character, you could do worse as a role model yeah. than, than Frank Gorshin as the Riddler. Um, it, it, it worked. It worked for him, and it, worked, and, and it was just... But um, I lost my train of thought again. Any other, any other thoughts on... on Rebooting. Uh, I kind of like to see some of the, the ancienter travels, the, the throwaway lines we've gotten in episodes. For example, the Corsair, oh, oh naughty girl. <laughs> I'd like to see what the, you know, you know, him continuously acting with a Time Lord who's mostly on his side, as opposed mm. to having to react to the renegades. Yeah, I think they do like stuff that. like that for the books, mm -hmm. so that the books have well, to tell the story. Well, also something well, like, what, like what he had with Romana when she was his companion as well. That was that was a good, I mean, two Time Lords. And that's what I liked about Shada. There's a third Time Lord thrown in there. Yeah. That's helping the Doctor along. Yeah. It was kind of interesting to see these different, you know, perspectives of other Time Lords. I mean, I think it would be great. Yeah. Although, you know, you start to wonder how many of these damn renegade Time Lords. I, that's what, that's why I was so shocked. That, you know, like they list off all these time lords and then all these ancient renegades. I'm just like, wow. I mean, uh, like I said, Shadow would be would have been really interesting to the entire canon if it had had actually made it fully on air. Although they also made it clear that the time the, the mainstream time lords are pretty darn corrupt as well. You know? Oh yeah. The um, in fact, and, and, and one of the things I liked, one of the few things I liked about uh, David Tennant's final two parter was. Establishing that the doctor didn't, you know, the, the Gallifrey wasn't collateral damage in stopping the Daleks. Um, that, they were that, just as bad. Yeah, that 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 what you know he did what he did because he they both needed to be stopped, uh, not just stopping the Daleks. Because the impression that they'd given up until that point <coughs> was was that you know he had to destroy Gallifrey in order to destroy the Daleks. Then it wound up not working anyway because they were all trapped in. Whatever it was they were trapped in. To me, that always bugged me it, because it just felt so much like Superman with Krypton. You know, he, he can't have a home. It's just kind of a weird thing. Well, he hasn't had a home really for a long time. Uh, and 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 Gallifrey was becoming. I, I think part of it was watching how Gallifrey had become too much of a crutch in the later years of the show. And I, I suspect Davies made a very conscious decision there to like get rid of that support <laughs> system, get rid of that right uh, fallback. You know, have him go back to the basics of him being on his own. So give him an excuse to go to Earth so often. Also that, yes. Um, it's funny, because one of the reasons why he keeps going back to Earth and hasn't been going to other planets as much is every time they do a show on another planet, the ratings drop. You know, and, yeah. you know, it's a business, and uh, they have to treat it that way, so the... Um, but all the other see. planets look like a quarry. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well they are. <laughs> yes, we're gonna. We're actually going to discover that if we ever actually make it out into space, that all other planets look like quarries. It's kind of funny, though. It almost, <coughs> if you think of it in the context of the show, suddenly, to everyone, since it's set on Earth, it's like winning the lottery. You too could be a companion. One in 176 billion, but it could be you. 
one one of the things I like about this particular the, the, the one the one change one substantive change they made when they when the show started up again in two thousand five was the companions actually having exterior lives. Yes. 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 You yeah. Know, yeah. The the up up until then, uh, aside really from Ian and Barbara, you know, at the very beginning, none of them they're all like. We're perfectly happy to just completely up in their lives and travel in a phone box with with somebody, and you never got any impression that anybody missed them, right? You know, or that they had people that they left behind, which really doesn't make any sense. You well, know, well, if you're in a time machine, you can get back the second you left. I well, well, if you're in a time machine that works. Well, <laughs> I mean, one, I mean, one of the things I absolutely adored in in the in Eccleston's uh, one season was when he brought Rose back he thought it was 12 hours later and it was a year later and they were like you know they had, they had like you know interrogated like they had arrested Mickey because they thought he killed her you know there were little have you seen my daughter pop pictures all up everywhere I loved that I yeah, was yeah. Great. and yeah. that and I, I like that I like that 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 you've got the doctors, people with, with actual families and, and people who care the about doctor's them. interference actually has consequences yes yeah and sometimes they're good consequences I mean look at Mickey Smith Look at how he evolved as a character. He, you know, he went from the guy, you know, hugging roses at waist, saying, "Please don't kill me," to, you know, the guy, the guy you cheer when he shows up in in the in the Torchwood lab because now now something's going to get done. You know, that's a hell of an evolution. <laughs> and it's interesting. He wasn't even a main companion, right? On the first, you know, when they first introduced him, he was yeah. just kind of there as a side. But they Come took the relief, time really. to develop that character, yeah. and I love it when they do that. Well, yeah. that's what I love about Rory. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I really yeah. felt like he. I mean, he went from Rory the nurse to Rory the centurion. I mean, yeah, yeah. he went I from mean, a third wheel to an actual yeah. working fourth wheel part yeah. of the, <laughs> <laughs> to an actual working part yeah. of the group. Yeah. 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 Uh, somebody was going to say something. Yeah, I just oh, you. One of the episodes that resonated with me was the Doctor's wife, uh, Neil Gaiman. Richard yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the whole line. No, I didn't take you where you wanted to go, but I always took you where you needed, needed to be. Go. Yeah. Yeah, which you kind of always knew that anyway, but it was nice to hear it said out loud. Can I just say about that episode, I was so happy when I rewatched that episode because I had a, a thing on my, my computer at my old job, as I was sitting at the desk with the wallpaper, of the doctor in the TARDIS, and he's standing there leaning out the door, and I realized the door opens in and the sign on the thing says, pull the open, yeah. and I went, <laughs> <laughs> has it always been like that? Yep, yeah. Like, and then I, I'm re-watching that episode, and the Doctor and the, the TARDIS incarnate are arguing, and they're arguing about opening the door. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'll open the door anyway, I damn well please, I'm the Doctor. And I, I was like, that's brilliant, somebody else noticed. <laughs> and you know Neil, Neil probably looked at that same picture. Yeah. <laughs> and was thinking, hey. <laughs> well, even so, and, and in fact, that that's... That's the sort of thing that, that a good reboot does is take a look at what went before and you know what didn't make sense and what kind of stuff like little things like throwaway lines like um, when Martha asked the doctor if there's a isn't there a class you can take and how to operate the TARDIS is, that you can take he says yes I took it and I failed <laughs> <laughs> the whole show makes more sense after that one line yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For that matter, the design of the TARDIS console at Journey's End, ha they, they made it clear that it's supposed to be operated by like six people, which makes sense because there's like 800 different, you know. Yeah. Um, it makes sense that it should have, you know, a crew and somebody to actually, you know, hold down the lever and hit it with the, hit it with the socket wrench, which is... Maybe that could be our reboot. It's the doctor and the crew of the TARDIS. Yeah. yeah. Then, then yeah. you get back into the Time Lord Sentai thing. We yeah. had a conversation at another panel last year about that, that it could be a full crew, right. and all of them could be, you know, companions, but then they get bumped off here and there because of the adventures, and they get down to one, and oh, that would be a good backstory for that. Well, TARDIS Voyager. And we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, really, the only no, time we ever see TARDIS is in action are the Renegades. <laughs> Yeah. When you only have the one person running it, I mean, you've never actually seen one fully manned until yeah, that. Except for that one scene yeah. in Journey's End, yeah. Which, which was actually kind of cool. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was. yeah. yeah. So that's what happens when, when a TARDIS has a full crew. Okay. Yeah, when it's actually <laughs> functioning properly, yes. Yeah. Wait, we're on the second? Really? That's never happened before. Yeah. <laughs> Responsible for the six people on this bridge and the 1400 we never see. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's why I made a conscious choice. I was involved in the, the creation of an original Star Trek series uh, that we did in Ebook form called the Starfleet Corps of Engineers. And one of the things I insisted on was that it be a small ship with only 40 people on it. So we didn't have, you know, seven people doing all the work and, you know, 
hundreds and hundreds of other people who basically, I don't know, you know, swept, swept the floors or something, you know, or... Just... Cold, cold in the furnace. Right, yeah, <laughs> you know. Make up my bed. Yeah. Um, I also, we also tried to occasionally show, you know, beta and gamma shift, too, just because, you know, it's like everything always happens on alpha shift, every time. I think there have been three different series. Huh? Starship, Corps of Engineers, Alpha Shift, Beta Shift, <laughs> <Beta Shift. laughs> and then you have crossover episodes. That's right. Yeah, just like after Who You Kill, we went for the smaller kids, right, the kids, yeah. and the adults. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, one of one of our writers very deliberately had an entire thing set on Gamma Shift just to have different people on the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> no, we would already introduced them in other. They all wore red shirts. <laughs> yes. But none of them died. Well, some of them died, but that was all. We actually, we actually had one story where we killed half the crew, but uh, that was Dave Mack. He does that. Any other questions from the audience, or comments, or suggestions for reboots, or other ways? Well, I always wondered if the Doctor stole one of the Tardises. Mm -hmm. How many did the Time Lords actually have sitting out there, and what were they doing with the rest of them? And what did they well, the one he like? stole was supposedly in for repairs. Yeah. So, so what are the rest of them being used for all the time? And how many are there? Mm. Well, we saw some of them sort of or, or, or variants in uh, what, war games. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they're there. They have them. Uh, yeah. I mean, what are they it doing with them? Yeah. 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 In the Doctor's Wife, we saw the remains of a lot of them. Yeah. 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 Something I think could be interesting is have a companion that is a non-human but is also not a Time Lord type character. That, that's hmm. Somebody that's still a finite, relatively short-lived being, but has a totally non-human perspective. I think it should be a parasite that takes over Martha Jones just so I can see her every single episode. Well, in, in, in the Doctor Who comic books, they had a, a companion who was a penguin oh, yeah. named Frobisher, which you can do in a comic book because you, know, you don't have to worry about casting. Um, but uh, well, and they did have the robot for you know a handful of episodes. Two yeah, episodes, yeah, because yeah, they couldn't actually make it work. Because again, you know, special effects budget. Um, the uh, but yeah, I mean, we have had some aliens who were, who were allegedly aliens on the TARDIS, but they were all basically human. Yeah. You know, like Trello, for example. You know, and, yeah, taking and somebody that, that is a specific non-human voice that you use as a writing device for. for I mean, one of the things I liked. One of the things I liked about stories. Trello was that he was a male companion who was basically a coward. And, and who only looked out for himself, which was a which was just just for a change, you know, um, you know. After after getting years of the Stevens and the and the Ians and the and the, the Harry Sullivans and the, the other guys leading with their jaws, you know, it was nice to get somebody who was like, screw this, I'm hiding under the table until everything's good, you know, until it's safe. Uh, but uh, so, what races do you think would be making a good companion? Because the first ones that come to my mind are just from the, the first season of the reboot, the the evolved trees. Oh yeah, yeah they were cool. Yeah. They were yeah. I mean, that, I don't know if they could afford them to do that makeup every week. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that and I like the interaction between her. I have a feeling you can, yeah, you can play with costuming and some things that probably yeah. Well, you could yeah, streamline it. You know, if they yeah. could make Planet of the Apes makeup work on a mm. weekly basis back in the '70s, I would think now surely yeah. they could find a streamlined version of that that was close yeah. enough that would, would be viable. They could have elements on them and do other elements, you know, green screen also, you know, sure. like how green screens do with elements on it and then like fill in the blanks. Yeah. I mean, they put the cheap stuff on so they can get in character and do the expensive stuff on the computer. But I, it just struck me that it could be interesting to have somebody that, you know, because you're always getting the doctor explaining to the humans why he's doing this and the humans are giving their point of view. But yeah. You know, that's mostly so coming from a we different as the mindset audience entirely. Yeah. Getting. Yeah, the exactly. audience can make Farscape, but, the Brits can make, you know, an alien companion. <laughs> well, the, 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 the creature, uh, the, Farscape was the creature shop, and they, they're, they're special. Um, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, and sadly, we are, we, you know, not everyone can be the creature shop. Um, I mean, I would like to see a Cyberman, or, or just like one of his, like, mortal enemies, like, monster-wise, so cool. and, you know, being a companion. You just pull, 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 pull 7 of 9. Pull 7 of 9, yeah. that's exactly yes. where my brain is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it would be definitely an like interesting a, Like a reformed day. Cyberman. That would yeah, be really interesting, well, actually. Or like the, the girl from Torchwood that was partially converted. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, th I think it would be really interesting. I think you should have a casting call out a couple of them come out. So when the angels come out, you can go, are we going back in time? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So there we go. Yeah, that, 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 that actually discovers that he doesn't want to go back in the shell and has some other apparatus instead. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. That'd then be then basically cool. the doctor would be traveling with a little squid. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. He could sit on his shoulder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all thinking that. Like, like, like a pirate. Right. Yeah. yeah. With an iPad on the squid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's why you yeah. could yeah. yeah. then do more or less anything you wanted visually with it. Mm. Right. So, so he doesn't look like a Dalek anymore, but still has the Dalek yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think that could be really cool. Although you really don't want to have a companion who talks in a monotone. <laughs> yeah. If you can avoid that. What about one of the cat nurses? Mm. They kind of are that a little more to the chewy moral center of the universe. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good one, yeah. That, that, would, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. You, you sort of wonder what sort of things K9 left around the TARDIS. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just stray nuts and bolts. Yeah. Some oil, oil yeah, yeah. Oil. Oil spill. I have to admit, that was one of my absolute favorite moments was when they, when they brought Sarah Jane and K9 back. That was yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was in geek heaven. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love the one up in yeah. 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 Seriously. <laughs> and of course, by the end of the episode, they're both carping on the doctor and. Bonnie. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's so true. The way they did Does he still pet it? <laughs> <laughs> the way they did that. And, and that, that, that was your classic case of you know you know your ex girlfriend talking to your current girlfriend you know. <laughs> and, it's like, yeah, uh, and you can just every see guy's worst language. nightmare. He played it so well. Oh yeah. You know yeah. the body language by the end is just kind of. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great because it, it tells you how much he cares about the character. He totally got into the character, mm -hmm. all of the characters yeah. that made it was totally cool. Well, they did the scene with uh, Sarah Jane and and, uh, and Rose just laughing their heads off. Yeah. <laughs> David was standing off camera wearing this big mustache. Oh, really? <laughs> and that's wow. what was, that's what got them all tickled. Ah. <laughs> you have a yeah. question? I think a beneficial companion would be uh, one of the. Um, I can't remember what they're called, but one of the fortune tellers from the Fires of Pompeii. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. One of the oracles. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know if I could stand watching somebody talking cryptically every time for an entire hour, but yeah. Um, I, the, the, the tendency that Davies had toward prophetic, toward prophecy, uh, got kind of tiresome after a while, because that, uh, the problem, especially in a show that, that at its heart has always been rationalist. You know, one of the things I always liked about Doctor Who was that it was never about mysticism. It was always eventually about science. You know, like the, when, one, of, one of my absolute favorite Doctor Who moments was in the Brain of Morbius, when when the sacred fire was dying and and they were concerned because they had angered the gods or this and that, and it turned out to be soot. <laughs> you know, um, and and you know the, the the whole thing with you know with with all the different prophecies we kept getting uh, in 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 Davies Doctor Who just kind of irritated me, and I just I. I think that goes counter to what <coughs> what makes Doctor Who cool is that in, in, in on Doctor Who there's always a rational explanation for everything. Well, with, with prophecy, yeah. you're dealing with time travel, so yeah. Yeah. things happen because they kind of have to happen. Which was I think was actually introduced in that Fires of Pompeii episode. Was the, was that the first time we got the concept of fixed points in time that yeah. can't change? No, the first no, that was back mm -hmm. in Father's Day actually. Was fa oh Father's yeah. Day? That's right. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was that was which is one of my all-time favorite episodes yeah. actually. But like one of the things I loved about the fires of Pompeii was that, you know, Pompeii happened because of the Doctor, and it was because he was saving the rest of the planet. He had to kill these two or three thousand people, however yeah. many there were, and yeah. that was a really interesting turn for yeah. that whole story. Yeah. Yeah, I thought Donald's uh, when Donna realized what kind of decision he was having to make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And she put her hands on about that alternative. I thought that was interesting. Really, that character, she was always like a bit, I think she had before that, had not really liked the doctor's decisions at certain mm -hmm. points. Yeah. But she hadn't really understood why he made the decisions he did. Yeah. But it was like suddenly a light bulb came on. So suddenly, then she realized, oh, yeah. he's making, he has to make the best of two bad choices most of the time. That, that really brought that character around for me too. That was a really yeah. strong script right there. And that, she that, nailed it. That's something else that the, the show has done is, is actually having character arcs, which yeah. which the the, the the 20th century iteration of who very rarely had. Um, you know, the, the, every once in a while there were there were nods to it, particularly um, like with Tegan, for example. That sort of the, the the weight of everything that kept happening uh, eventually having a cumulative effect on her to the point where in Resurrection of the Dolls she had she just had to get out of there. 
Um, but even that, you know, most most of the characters pretty much were in the same place they were when they left the TARDIS as they were when they came on, which which you know wor works if you're just doing a straight up adventure thing. But I think it ad it adds more texture to it when the people change. You know, when you get things like Mickey and like Rory and and and, and it makes for a better show. Yeah, and, you know, over the long term. Yeah, yeah. I had a complex idea about the uh, relationship between the TARDIS, the companion, and the Doctor. If, well, in Star Trek, there was a Doctor on the on, that was actually a hologram. Right. I'm um, yeah. What if there was a manifestation of the TARDIS? And it, well, that would be interesting because it could change, you know, be a different person for different situations, uh, but it would always kind of be on the Doctor's neck about the decisions he made in the past. And the TARDIS' perspective, okay, I don't think you should have handled it that way. Yes, I think it would be there, there have been it. other shows that have done that. And it, it, you know, um, I'm thinking of Andromeda with, with Lexa Doig's character, who yeah. is basically the embodiment of the ship. or, or um, The Avatar. Yeah, the Avatar. Yeah. Um, and that actually worked really well. And even in a far escape, he has a pilot. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who's, well, in that case, the ship was alive. So Yeah, yeah he, but he was the only one that was really in tune. Yeah, well, he was the one who communicated, you know, and, and communicated one of his thoughts, which also, yeah, that worked, that worked really yeah. well in Farscape as well. Um, Everything worked well on that show. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. But, um, except when they, uh, it was funny, I, I did a, this is a digression, I did a Farscape comic book that I wrote with uh, Rockney O'Bannon that continued the show after the, after the Peacekeeper Wars. And I had to keep reminding Rockney that, no, we can bring these characters back because we don't have to have the, make, have the creature shop make one. It was like there were certain aliens that they only did once because it was such a nightmare <laughs> between them, like the Xiang who breathed fire. They, they, they only did them twice, and it was like they never could do them again because it was such a pain in the ass, you know, with the suits and everything. I was like, no, Rockney, it's a comic book. <laughs> we can bring them back if we want to. It's like, right, yes, I keep forgetting. And that's, why, that's why you never saw any more Hynerians after that one time. That was like, because it takes like six people to operate Rigel. Yeah. And then they brought in another Hynerian and took another six people, and it's like, that's why Rigel never went home. <laughs> you know, um, there was no way they could do an entire planet of talking frogs. Um, which is why that was the first thing we did in the comic book, because, again, no budget. But, um, yeah, and, that, and that, that's always going to be, jumping back to Doctor Who, one of the limitations. I mean, it's why you always have human companions. It's why you, you know, um, well, aren't they it Watson, mostly sticks with. In essence, aren't they like just new manifestations of, of Sherlock Holmes and Watson, you know? To some extent, yeah. I mean, it, it, there's certainly that element, and... and Part of it depends on who the companion is, you know, because uh, Watson wasn't just some idiot who, who, you know, I mean, he was basically, uh, what makes Watson work as a character is he's the one person who can actually follow what Holmes is saying. And relay you know, it. And, and, and yeah. relay it to, and translate it into human, yes. you know, <laughs> um, and, and, and some of the best companions can do that as well, but it's, it, it, the, 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 the interaction isn't always a perfect. That's why I like Donna so much, because she didn't just, you know, relay, she questioned. Mm -hmm. I think she was a really yeah. was she the first one that did that or were there other ones? In the oh past? no, there, well there are plenty in the yeah. past that did. Tegan uh, is one example. Sarah Jane did too. Yeah, that was one. That was one. Yeah, yeah. She was she was constantly poking. Women that call bullshit on the doctor. Yeah. 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 See that's well, what that matter. Jamie did to, to some degree with yeah. with uh, mm -hmm. with the second doctor. He would he would at the very least you know say what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's why I'm curious about the new companion that we're getting. With some of the stuff they've said about her, I'm, I'm really okay. curious to see what you know how, how they're going to play her because they say she's going to be able to out talk the doctor, which means if you're able to out talk the doctor, you might actually understand what he's saying. Mm. So I'm really curious about how they're going to handle that. I'm waiting for Christmas I, I on that one. I just want them to slow down a little bit. Well, see, one of the reasons right. they always had to have so somebody frantic. the doctor had to explain to is for the audience. It's yeah. like in any book or any yeah, TV right. show, yeah. if someone's talking over the audience's head, he has to be able to have somebody on screen that he's got to explain yeah. to. He yeah. can't turn to the camera. It's all, yeah, it's a handy vehicle for exposition. So you've yeah. now got two people that are that intelligent that really don't have to explain things to each other. How is that going to work? Well, I, mean, I, th I thought it worked really well with Ramona. That, that did. They were very, very well done. And, yeah. that, and that's, that's what I'm assuming is going to happen with this. I just I hope mean, they can handle it that way. Well, I especially uh, well, especially like with Romana, it was it was more a case of the other way around, yeah. where it wasn't that the concepts were over Romana's head; it was that she thought the doctor was doing things stupidly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I give a lot of faith to a lot of faith to Moffat. I mean, he hasn't let me down yet. He has done a good job so yeah. far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he, he I'm, I'm, I'm hoping he'll he'll dial back the the story arc elements just because there, there, there's there's a danger of constant diminishing returns where where okay you know this year this big thing happened we ended up so now we have to do something even bigger and then and the next year it's going to be even bigger and now we're going to blow up the whole universe and it's like it, after a certain point it's like really well, no, you know I'm um, on that. I think well, yeah. my favorite episodes are the one-offs 
sometimes. Yeah, and, and honestly, that. that's where Moffat's strength as a writer is anyway. Davies was good at, you know, seeding things and, build, and, and, and creating a structure like that. Moffat's not as good at it, and he's much better at just doing individual really, really, really good stories. No, 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 I, I, and I think he's better off... Um, I think the show would be better off with more standalone episodes and, and focusing less on big story. Well, arcs. I don't know. I, I think everything he's been doing is building to the fiftieth. I think from 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 yeah. from day one, everything's he knew he was gonna. You know, once he got the reins, he was gonna be going all the way to the fiftieth. Yeah. And I think all this is gonna wrap up, tie up to the fiftieth. And so. I think I think that's the story he's telling. Hmm. What if they brought back two of the other doctors like they did in the past? Well, they pro the problem is um, there, there, there's an issue with Eccleston in that he won't do it. Um, he's, 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 he's one of those weird, you know, method actor types who has particular ways of doing things. And they wouldn't have he to won't. bring back Eccleston if they put in the next Doctor, if they're going to have him regenerate this season. Yeah, but, well, yeah, they could. I mean, they they could bring other doctors in fairly easily. Well, Hell, they could bring in Paul McGann, McGann if they wanted to, you know, yeah. uh, or Sylvester. He McCoy. said he'd do it, by the way. I saw oh the yeah, icon. yeah. yeah. Um, McGann's game and Paul McGann's game too. Yeah. Um, he might. Well, he's probably more pleasantly disposed. Peter David, 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 yeah. yeah, Peter Davison did for the the the. The little, uh, the, the time crashed that, that uh, was a really neat bit. Yeah. yeah. No, it yeah. They did it beautifully. And Moffat wrote that also, actually. And, and one of the um, best lines in it is when he steps up and says, My God, he changed the desktop. <laughs> <laughs> I love watching the, the, the Davison ones where they have the cutting edge computer graphics. Um, <laughs> And, and and what's worse, I remember watching them when they first aired and thinking, Wow, those are really cool computer graphics. <laughs> but um, the. Uh, I. I, I they haven't dipped. That's the one thing they haven't done in the new show yet. Is done the their version of the three doctors and the five doctors or the, or the two doctors, is having him encounter, aside from time crash, which is you know not really part of the mainline story. Actually, uh, um, wouldn't it be interesting? Well, in, in the comic books, uh, there's Superman, and he actually met Superman Prime, who was the ultimate manifestation of himself, who came back and met him. But for them, when, the, all the old you know fifties thing where Earth Two would cross over with Earth One, and, yeah. and he had to deal with stuff involving yeah. the sun and everything, and come back. Um, would that be cool to see Doctor Who standing next to what he's going to end up as, and have to like, I don't know, like address that? It's it's harder to do that because then you you don't want to tie yourself to, especially when you're producing an ongoing TV show that has lots of external factors. You don't want to tie yourself to um, something that's going to happen that you may not be able to make happen later. Something Joe Straczynski learned to his regret when he did Babylon 5. You know, he did a flash forward to the station exploding around Garibaldi, not taking into account little things like that wasn't how the story was going to go, plus the fact that Jerry Doyle was going to go bald. Um, <laughs> you know, or having to, you know, structure an entire scene around Londo Malari not being able to wear the suit he wants to wear and having to get his old one from the cleaners because three years earlier he did a flash forward of him wearing the purple suit while the shadows came flying over his planet. You know, um, it's, it's, Dangerous to tie yourself in to, to forcing yourself to do something in the future and then having to come back go back on it later um, Or not be able to Things fulfill change. it. Oh, and yeah, yeah, but then that but that takes the fun out of doing the flash forward if you can So it's, it's easier to have him meet past versions of the doctor where we already know what happened to them So you gotcha. don't have to worry about about screwing yourself over going forward You know that, the that the Yard cool opened up a, a can of worms on the already front. know. Yeah, guys yeah but that was sort of a manifestation. Yeah. Early and, and yeah, it and wasn't actually the Doctor. Really in episode four, and then you have the Doctor you're familiar with for the rest of that season. Yeah. I was really know, interested in the NT and like, I know he's, like, I guess he's still young on, you know, in terms of his species. I would like to know, like, mm. what's next. Go ahead. Um, my understanding um, was that when they first introduced the concept of regeneration, that there was supposed to be a finite number of regenerations that was possible, yeah. and that they're yeah. fast approaching yeah. that actual number. Yeah. They're, they're, right. They've already it's passed the most, it. No, they haven't. Yeah, no, if, if you go to the, 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 uh, has, the, the Brain of Mobius, it. you saw past incarnations of the Doctor, and if you if you look at some of the other episodes, you've seen other incarnations yeah. of the Doctor. Yes. They've passed that long long ago, but in the Five no, Doctors... It's supposed to be regenerations, I believe. Yeah, but I mean, but if you, if you go to... Five doctors, they offered the master. If you help the doctor, it will restore your regeneration. Yes. Also, so honestly, it's, it's the most popular TV show in Britain. They're not going to tie them, they're not going to cancel the show because they of something that was established on an episode 20 years earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, eliminate that whole. There's about 800 other ways well, you can eliminate it without. But they've never said rebooting. that that is a yeah, physical rule. Yeah. Right. What if that's just a law? Yeah. Well, God who the hell is he to listen to the laws anyway? Exactly. exactly. Right. <laughs> and I think there was a line when he, when when Matt Smith appeared on Sarah Jane. There was a line about how uh, uh, 
something about how there was no limit on the regeneration. Yeah, he, yeah. he, he, he said to uh, uh, Clyde that they had like 313 or 323 regeneration. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's a, it's it's a, a, it's a non-issue. Number. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Um, I mean, although it's amazing how one decision to just recast one actor, enab- I mean, that's, that's what enabled the show to keep going. Yeah, you know, it was just it, it was just a simple, you know. Oh God, we got to do something because William Hartnell's dying and our show is still successful. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that, that looks like we're about out of time. Yeah. Oh, are we? Yeah. yeah. Eight. Oh my God, we're out of time. Um, no, we're not. Um, I'm doing a reading <laughs> somewhere. I'm doing a reading in Cove. If anybody wants to see that, and uh, I'm sorry, in the boardroom. This is Cove. Um, and, and I'm performing it for, and I do have a Doctor Who song in my set. Ooh. And you should go see that because he's he's very talented. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, thank you all. Let's go. Let's go.